It is a testament to what's possible in this country and to the strength and brilliance of an individual that someone could be born a refugee in a camp in Germany after World War II and yet one day sit on the Supreme Court of Canada. That seemingly impossible journey is the subject of a new film premiering at this year's Hot Docs Film Festival. It's called Without Precedent, The Supreme Life of Rosalia Bella. And it brings the aforementioned, now retired, Supreme Court Justice Rosalia Bella and the documentary's producer, director, and writer, Barry Averich, to our studio. Barry, you I see all the time. <laughs> you, hello. Welcome. Yeah, we don't see each other enough. But I now that I'm retired... <laughs> nice. <laughs> okay, nice. so here's my first question, and I'm going to go to him on the first question. Fine. <laughs> We've had a lot of Supreme Court justices over the last 156 years. What makes this one distinctive enough to be worthy of a feature-length documentary? Well, with no disrespect to uh, Rosalie Abella's predecessors, Rosie, and I call her Rosie, Everybody is, does. is my name. the most <laughs> uh, human of humans I've ever met. She does not personify a Supreme Court judge. Um, she fills a frame. She's my mother. She's my grandmother. She's my friend. Uh, it, it, it was instantaneous when we started to talk about this, uh, making this film. It's, it had to be done. The film opens with a quote of yours, Madam Justice Abella. I will never cater to the majority. I am prepared to be impartial and unpopular and do things that protect minorities. Where does that sense of your world come from? It was part of the way I was raised. It was part of my understanding of the history that I came from. It's the story of this generation. I, I think you cannot have come into the world after World War II without having a very lively sense of how much injustice there was and develop a commitment, which most people I knew growing up felt, to making sure that we reduced injustice as time went on. So I didn't feel unique. I felt that it was a generational mission to do whatever we could to make the world fair. We, we had a long way to go from where we'd been. So I, I can't take any credit, Steve, for thinking about something original. It was just in the DNA of people who were born when I was. One of the things I learned when I watched this film, which uh, we all did earlier this week at the opening at Hot Docs, your father, who was a lawyer in the old country, was slated to be appointed mm -hmm. a judge and then something called World War II broke out, and that was the end of that. When did you find out he was supposed to be appointed a judge? I was speaking at the opening of Pier 21, and I asked my mother what date we actually arrived in Canada. Was it May 30th? Was it May 31st in 1950? And she handed me a couple of envelopes that I'd never seen before, and in those envelopes were papers, which included papers from Europe, from lawyers and judges that my father worked with in Germany, and there was this document that said that my father was eligible to become, to write the exam to become a judge. That was the European system. You could either go to the legal stream, the lawyer stream, or the judge stream. He had finished his master's in law and was uh, set to do something I had no idea he was gonna do. And I'm not surprised that I didn't know. It would have felt utterly irrelevant. It to ha in any of our conversations. I wanted to be a lawyer as he was. In 1970, a month before I graduated from law school, he died. So a conversation about maybe one day you'll be a judge was absolutely inconceivable. So to find that replacing his dream of being a lawyer also turned into a fairy tale replacement of his wish to become a judge was... Um, one of the most moving discoveries I made in, among many in his papers. So we, had ne we never talked about it. Mm. Never, never talked about it. And it was an incredible moment in the film. And I, I mean, I'm not going to cast you in the role of amateur psychiatrist here, Barry, but Thank you. did you at some point ask yourself, I wonder if she is basically fulfilling you know, her father's mission? He couldn't do it. She did do it. Listen, I think as, as the amazing childhood that she describes in her family life, uh, who wouldn't want to do that? 
I mean, Rosie, and she's sitting right here, always had her own trajectory, planned or not, uh, that uh, certainly you want to make your father proud. We want to make our parents proud. But this extraordinary person had her own DNA and her own mission, certainly with the roots that her father planted her, planted in her in terms of her life and where they had come from. But wow, I'm, I, there's obviously, if this man was here today, he'd be extraordinarily proud. And you look at her, uh, her speech when she addresses the Supreme Court, when she becomes uh, sworn in, and then when she leaves, and it's all about her parents. Now that and, you mention that, wow. I think we may just happen to have that standing by. Perfect. <laughs> You're a director. Shall I just ask the director? Mr. Roller. Director, can we have the, uh, where are we here? Yeah, clip on the last page there. Let's bring that up right now, shall we? This day, like everything else in my life, would not be possible without my parents. They were Holocaust survivors whose lives and families were destroyed, but whose optimism and belief in the goodness of people never were. They brought my sister and me to Canada in 1950 with the highest hopes for a happy life. They got it, and they gave it to me. I have been so lucky. And so, on the eve of my 75th birthday on Canada Day, I say to Canada on their behalf, thank you. Thank you for giving them the life they dreamed of and for giving me a life beyond their wildest dreams. I am so proud and lucky to be a Canadian. Thank you. I'm told it's tough to get a standing ovation from that crowd, and yet you did. <laughs> All I had to do was leave. <laughs> <laughs> Truthfully, though, I mean, I know how you... Uh, uh, you've told us already how you feel about your folks, how you feel about your family. How did you get through that speech without completely breaking down? You I held it together, but barely. Oh, I don't think I held it together. Oh, you, well. I was determined that I was going to give a final speech. As I wrote it, I was able to write it without crying. And then suddenly I was just overwhelmed by the moment. And it was my whole, the arc of my life that came before me as I was paying tribute to a, an ending of a chapter that started in a place nobody knew uh, was going to be as receptive as it turned out to be. There was a lot of hope, um, no sense of expectation, just hope and hard work. Uh, and it was my father's mission. Uh, there was no doubt that the reason I wanted to be a lawyer was because he couldn't be. Um, so you're right, it became mine. But before it became mine, before I had any idea what being a lawyer meant, I just wanted to be what he wasn't allowed to be because he couldn't be a citizen. That would have taken five years. He had to support his family, and he never, ever complained about the fact that he wasn't. But it was my, it was my goal. I want to ask you about this. He never complained. You, neither of them did. Neither of your parents complained, despite the fact they spent the war years right. in a concentration camp. And lost a son. And, and lost a brother lost... You, a brother you never knew. You never knew. When, when, when you've been touched by the Holocaust, as you and your family have been, when do you stop constantly thinking about that brother you never got a chance to meet? I think about their story all the time. I think about all of the survivors. How, how did they survive? How did they come through? What resilience brought them to find enough hope and optimism to create a life for their kids? And they did. There were thousands of them. 33,000, I think, came to Canada. Canada... Uh, eventually <laughs> welcomed the Jewish refugees. We know from Irving Abella's book, None is Too Many, it took a while. Just for those who don't know, that's your husband, your right. late husband, Irving right. Abella, who wrote this fantastic book, None is Too Many, um, about the fact that this country was not completely welcoming to Jewish refugees after World War II, as the title implies. And then, and then by 1950, they let us in. Then it was a very warm, generous meritocracy. You worked really hard. I didn't know an immigrant who didn't do everything they could to pay back Canada for letting them in and for the chances that they gave to be away from the despair and the tragedy and have a chance to rise again. So in, in our house, it wasn't just that they never cried when they answered my questions about 
how did they do it, what did they feel. They were very open in answering my questions. It, it wasn't a, a, a sense of there are demons and there are ghosts and we don't want to talk about it. And I, and I appreciate that every Holocaust survivor resurrected herself or himself differently. But in my house, they talked openly. They never hid anything. How did it feel when, when you found out your son was killed? How did it feel when you lost your, your factory? How did it feel when the Germans took over your business? How did it feel in concentration camp? They always were very, very open. And so without crying, it was part of the family narrative. So they never cried when they told me the stories, and I always did. <laughs> You've made a lot of movies in your time, and I want to ask you if somebody came to you with a script that said, born in a DP camp in Eastern Europe at the end of the war, ends up becoming Supreme Court of Canada Justice with a birthday on Canada Day. I that mean, was pretty good, wasn't it? <laughs> you'd, have, you'd have thrown them out of your office saying this is too fantastical, right? Oh, I would have said, will you take the role? <laughs> I mean, I, I definitely think there's a there's a a scripted feature here. I mean, it, it's spectacular. As I felt the same way when we started to talk about this when I was doing Prosecuting Evil with Ben Ferenz. I mean, there, there's some great parallels in their stories. He's They're, the Nuremberg the, lawyer. He's the Nuremberg, Nuremberg, the last living Nuremberg prosecutor, went on to create, be a co-creator of the International Criminal Court, create reparations. I mean, they're both uh, uh, human rights champions who believed, and Ben always said, uh, you know, uh, the law, not war. And, and certainly, you know, Rosalia Bell is born of the same DNA, and, and uh, she obviously knew who Ben was. He did, ben did okay. not know Rosalia Bella yet, but when, but when he saw her in the film, he then started to do his research. And, he, and when I called him, he would, he would recite various things about Rosalia Bella, so he was quite taken by her. And he just uh, died at age? 103. God incredible. bless him. He was remarkable. Fantastic. Yeah. Here's another question, you know, I've always wanted to ask you, and your son, Zach, describes you this way in the film. You know, he describes his dad as being sort of more in the background, and you, he describes as Broadway. Judges are not supposed to be Broadway. Judges are supposed to be out of sight, out of mind, right? What made you think you could have a career in that profession and be Broadway? I... Never thought about it. They, this was Roy McMurtry as Attorney General in 1976 saying, do you want to be a judge? And you're how old? 29, pregnant with our second, with Zachary, with our second son. And I said, wow, really? Me? Of course, that sounds great. So I, I, I honestly, Never thought about how I was supposed to behave now that I was a judge. You never thought, boy, I'm going to have to tone this down a little bit. Never. I stop couldn't. Go, stop going to receptions. I couldn't. <laughs> well, I never went to receptions. I didn't go to receptions. As a judge? Well, yeah. Well, yeah, I did. But I, I lived, uh, there was nothing about me that ever said, no little voice inside me saying, so it's time not to wear bling or get <laughs> no lose kidding. the colors. Or, I mean, you can't not be who you are, no matter what you do. I just don't believe it. And the idea that you had to be a certain way as a lawyer or as a judge didn't work for people who weren't like those people were. Nobody told you along the way, you, you gotta tone it down. If you, wanna, if you wanna go far in this profession, you gotta tone it down a bit. No, because I wasn't gonna go far in the profession because I didn't wanna go far in the profession. I was just happy to be a judge. That's why we made the film. I mean, you know, it, it's one-third character, two-thirds brilliance uh, in terms of what she stands for. But, you know, there's never been a documentary that I'm aware of on a Canadian Supreme Court judge. I don't think there'll ever be one again. I mean, this is the whole sum total of brilliance, Hollywood casting, uh, a life of meaning and purpose and caring. It's the whole package. It's the whole package. So, you know, that's why we made it. I mean... You, you've been to her home. You've been to her office. Have you seen more Chachkas and Drek in your life? I was going to call oh, the film. Oh, that's not fair. I it was going all to Drek. There's some good stuff. There in is there. some good stuff. I haven't found it, but there is. But <laughs> here, I was going to call the film. Everything is for sale. <laughs> everything is for sale. In fact, there's a that would be my husband's dream. There's everything a visa sign in the window, so I, I thought everything is for sale. Uh, yes, but that's her. I mean, as somebody in the film says, one of her clerks says that it's like walking into her mind, and I've said it's like Boz Lorman has 
art directed her life. And fantastic. That's, yeah. that's her character. I think what you're asking is, how do you tailor your, your identity in order to fit into a pattern if you have ambitions to become someone at the top of whatever profession you're in. And you're going to say you didn't have those ambitions, so it wasn't an issue. I wanted to be a really good lawyer, and I knew what I had to do to be a really good lawyer. I had to work really hard. That was not an issue. Then when I became a judge, I wanted to be a really good judge. Nobody, we wear robes in court. Nobody sees that I'm wearing Mickey Mouse stockings when I'm or when a I'm purse a, that looks like a roller skate, which right. you had earlier this week at but the you screening. Don't, but you're not going to, you weren't going to take that direction. Even as we were leaving her home to do, to meet you in the studio, you know, her son was going, you sure you want to wear that necklace? <laughs> and she was going, yes, I, I am. I mean, you, you know, you're going to sing at your own Broadway show and so be it. <laughs> but you don't, first of all, you cannot tailor your life for the possibility that you are going to get into the eye of that needle. That one day, first of all, immigrants don't do that. They, they don't say, that's what I want to be. They say, I want to be really good at it. I want to take these opportunities and I want to make the most of them. But picking a goal and saying, that's what I'm going to be in a profession like law where mm. people are, there, there is a certain, there was in when I was practicing law in the 70s, first of all, no women on the family court bench when I was appointed. So how was I going to be like everybody else? And what in the world would make me think that one day I was going to be on the Court of Appeal or on the Supreme Court of Canada? Nothing. So I did. I was not afraid to take risks because there was nothing I was risking. If a phone call came, do you remember the famous story about uh, Sammy Khan, when somebody said, Mr. Khan, what came first? The words of the music? And he said, the phone the call. Oh, the phone, the phone call, call, right. Yeah. So I just said yes to everything, and it ended up, it led to the Supreme Court of Canada. It wasn't intended. Okay, but let me ask you this. Having, having rendered so many decisions over the years, and having had a chance, no doubt, now that you've left the bench, to sort of think about, did I get it all right? Is there anything you would change your mind about? Did you get anything wrong, I guess, is what I'm asking? Maybe. We'll find out. Time, is, time will tell. I never released a decision or gave a, a lecture or a speech where, where I didn't believe in what I was putting out as, as a public product. Mm -hmm. Never. But I was also aware that sometimes I instantly heard that I was upsetting people. I mean, controversy is where judges live. And that's why we have tenure and independence until we're 75 years of old. So we're not afraid of the reaction people will have to, to making decisions you think are right. Well, I think allegedly, according to the film, the only time you really upset people is with your cooking. <laughs> according that's, to uh, that's That your was family. when I physically upset them. That's true. With the cooking, <laughs> that's yes. That's true. <laughs> well, all right, Barry, you had a chance in this documentary to talk to three former prime ministers. Yes. You talked to other judges from other countries as well. What did you come away thinking the most important quality somebody who sits in that chair needs to be a good judge? That's an interesting question. It's a great question. I'll, I'll answer it in two ways. One is what my takeaway on the film, which was fascinating for me as a Canadian, not answering your question completely, is Rosalia Bella's global resonance. And as Canadians, we have our own inferiority complexes and, and we're worried about being too famous. Not that it ever entered her mind, but, but what, not being a lawyer, what fascinated me was that somebody could uh, um, effectually rule and write uh, and have resonance outside our borders. I love that, and I loved finding that out as I traveled the world making this film. That was fascinating uh, for me. I think ultimately, um, in certainly talking to people like former prime ministers and other judges in other countries, uh, is the fact that uh, this spectacular person um, is relevant no matter what decade we were in, um, that she was ahead of her time, and that what I love so much and very much a part of the arc of this film is that, and unlike other countries, is that she has a spectacular Act Three coming up. You don't... At Harvard, you mean? Anywhere. Wherever. Wherever it's, she it's goes. It's starting at Harvard. It's Harvard. You're at no, Harvard no, now. it's you know. Harvard. I'm, yeah. I'm there for a while. Okay. And we spoke to law students, and we spoke to uh, the former dean of Harvard, and, and, uh, and as we did last night, uh, uh, we were lucky enough to have uh, Justice Sonia Sotomayor, a, a seated Supreme Court uh, judge, talking about uh, Rosalie's uh, fantastic resonance, and those students of Harvard, very lucky. 
And, and I loved when they told me that, you know, they love hearing what she has to say and what's worked in this country and what it means for the rest of the world. Pulling an audible here, control room. Can we go, please, to the cavalcade of pictures from the screening that was held at the Hot Doc Cinema earlier? Okay, there is the aforementioned Sonia Sotomayor, along with the former Madam Justice Rosalie Abella, on stage at the Hot Doc Cinema. And there's Barry and Boy. Rosie together. And uh, we got one more picture. There you are, because you're getting a standing ovation a standing at that ovation. moment. Yeah, and, and, after and, the movie and you ended. don't see that often. I've, I've, I've not had a lot of standing ovations with my films, uh, and that was spectacular, emotional. It was a moment. And deserved. Yeah. Wow. Um, you, I, did a, you did an amazing job putting together that history and well, turning it into that You walked into onto moment. the stage, my well, darling. See, it was a good uh, moment. It was a good moment. And there was another good moment during the course of this, can you put the numbers up, Sheldon? I just happened to be watching CNN earlier today, and they asked, how confident are you in the U.S. Supreme Court? This is what the American public has to say. 37%, a great deal or quite a lot. 62%, not very much or no confidence. To which, la uh, <laughs> at that moment, with you and Sonia Sotomayor, apropos of nothing, you lean over to her in the middle of this discussion you're having after the film, and you say, so what's with your court? And she looks at you and says, ooh, that's below the belt. <laughs> Is that what she said? I don't remember. She said, oh, that's below ooh, the belt. And then badly. you said, too many belts. <laughs> Huge reaction. This was a great moment. This was a great moment. But I do want to ask you, like, what, what is with their court which at the moment is so discredited in the eyes of so many Americans, I think unlike our court, which does not suffer from that kind of thing? I think uh, we have been very lucky in Canada to remain tenaciously committed so far to the values that we got when we got a Charter of Rights and Freedoms. And I say that as someone who stood on the shoulders of the, of the judges of the Supreme Court of Canada in the 80s and 90s, who showed the way. They came out of the gate very muscular about protecting rights. There wasn't a tentative series of little steps until they figured out how to get it right. That's the Canadian tradition, and so far, that's held. So I, I appreciate how lucky we are. I also um, find it so difficult to see what's going on in the United States in the judicial system because there's no place to go after the Supreme Court of a country. It's the last word. And when the last word is a place that ends up taking rights away or shrinking them, an institution that to me and most of my colleagues all my life across this country and in most of the Western democracies, the court is the place you go to protect rights, to make sure the widest range of rights are available to the widest number of people. And to see it going in the opposite direction in the United States is, is particularly hard for someone who went to law school in the 60s, 67 to 70, mm -hmm. and looked to the American Supreme Court as the, as the metaphor for a strong, assertive Supreme Court. So uh, we're in debt to their uh, resilient jurisprudence, to their courage, to their bravery. So it makes me wistful to see what's happened now, and it makes me very worried because it has contributed to a sense of divisiveness and anger and mean-spiritedness and less tolerance for a points, points of view that are different from your own. Whereas here, I think we've protected the heterogeneity and been very respectful of people's differences. I'm proud of that. It's very Canadian, and I hope we can hold on to it. What well, you did see, too, that night, last, this particular night this week, uh, in that panel also, is two great friends having some fun with yeah. each other Rosie as well. Sonia. Rosie yeah. and Sonia Sotomayor. I mean, for, She's for, a remarkable woman. For her to show up, and for, again, I'm in awe of... of Rosalie Abella having that kind of circle of friends, and it doesn't stop with her. We're talking about you know international uh, justices everywhere. Recently in Ottawa, there was a I, I call it Rosie Palooza. Everybody got together to talk about her incredible career, and there are people from around the world, South Africa, Israel. 
all over the place. And so, you know, to see these two having a fun little spar uh, post-film was, was magical. In our remaining moments here, uh, we can't talk about your life without talking about Itchy. Itchy was the nickname of your husband, Irving Abella, the author, the historian, uh, and he's in this film. And you two are, when you are on camera together, you are kind of disgustingly adorable together. He was adorable. Because, well, you, you guys were great together. And, and he dies during the course of the making of this film. And Barry, I want to start with you because you needed to convince her to go back on camera and talk about this. Why and how did you do that? Without getting emotional, I'm going through something similar with my mom. And, and I felt it every step of the way with um, Irving and visiting Rosie when we were filming and seeing him in different stages. Um, and I, I just knew that I, I never wanted her to regret, you know, not having that moment to talk about his life on film um, and remember him for her grandchildren, for her, for her children, and for the world to understand the significance of this marriage and this relationship. And it wasn't easy to convince her of that. I just knew as a person going through this and as a filmmaker, I needed that button. And she, she did give in, and I think it's a, a poignant moment when one looks back on a, a legacy of a, a relationship. Why did you agree to it? My sons told me it was important. Barry was very sensitive and very patient. I really was so hard-pressed to think about how to even talk about what he had meant to me, what he does mean to me, and the family. But he, he created a very um, reassuring environment, and I knew that if, if it didn't work, I could trust him to do what he had to do to uh, be respectful of Vichy's memory and, and my ability to capture it. So it was essentially trust, trust that my kids' opinion was the right one and trust in Barry. And they both, they both turned out to be right. See, now that's the kind of thing I would have gone to Itchy with. I would have said, Itchy, what do you think? Should I be, <laughs> should I be doing this? So the vacuum, the advice vacuum, the, I don't think I ever made a decision, even small ones, without checking with him. So talking about what that meant, how do you do that? How do you express in words 54 years of reliance and love and need? And I mean, he was the rock for the whole family. You started this film, uh, you started the interview by saying this is a love story, and that was important to me. I mean, the poster that you have behind us on the set was critical in terms of our key art of the key image for this film was the two of them. It would have been easy to have a spectacular, regal-looking portrait of, of Abella in front of the Supreme Court judge, but it was about the two of them. He's holding a light, and she's in that light, and that's why that had to be the shot. Brilliant. Do you like the movie? <laughs> <laughs> now that you've seen it, uh, do you like the movie? Let me see. Am I, am I ready to move to Hollywood? <laughs> where? Yes. Uh, yes. 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 <laughs> but New York will be fine, too. Broadway, the Broadway show. I... Everything's coming up, Rosie. <laughs> well, Let's go. Good. It writes yeah. itself. That's good. It writes itself. I, I love that he wanted to do it. I love the way he did it. He really... He, he had to navigate a very different world from the world that he lives in. Yeah. This is lawyers and judges and academics, and uh, he could do the personal stuff easily because he's a very generous and loving person so that came easily but he got the grown-up stuff too <laughs> and and he wasn't afraid to ask questions and I wasn't afraid to ask questions and I in the end when I saw it I thought I can't imagine that this could have been done with more respect for the world I come from the home I come from the family I have, and I, I'm very honored and proud that Barry made this film. Awesome. It's called Without Precedent, The Supreme Life of Rosalia Bella, and we're delighted that it has brought 
the former Madam Justice Abella, now professor at Harvard University, and the producer, writer, director, Barry Averidge, to our studio here at TVO tonight. Thanks, you two. Thank you. Thank you. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.